Debbie Taylor Moore is the executive board member of the Consumer Technology Association. Melanie Simpson is corporate vice president HR for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And Olaf Graf is a professor of practice, UC Berkeley Haas, and chief executive officer of Cambrian AI. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Um, we're going to divide our discussion roughly into three themes that we will cover. We'll cover the current challenges and enablers in attracting high quality tech talent, how firms can future proof themselves against talent shortages, and how we can build ecosystems and environments of inno innovation in spite of economic pressures. Um, so I will start with Olaf. Um, and I will put you on, a on the spot a bit and have you make the bridge from our fireside chat just now. You think about the future of technology and innovation quite a bit in your, um, in your academic work. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we just heard and what you think is important as we think about ta talent in tech for the future. Mm. Yeah, so I, I listened uh, very attentively to Frederick's great uh, presentation and a number of things struck a chord. Um, there is a lot everybody can do to create an atmosphere of learning <coughs> and of uh, um, uh, the uh, you know, welcoming, uh, welcoming state of mind on, on innovation. But, uh, but there is particular responsibility on the part of leaders, especially senior leaders. And I think the, the picture, uh, the story that he conjured is very telling. <laughs> it starts with the senior leader. As a senior leader, you need to set the tone in the organization uh, that you are willing to incur failure and that you're going to reward good failure. Right? There's good failure and there's bad failure. We always say in Silicon Valley, fail fast right, and get back up again. And we say failure is good. Well, no, failure is not good if you're not learning. Failure is good if you're learning, right? Um, and so uh, establishing that paradigm as a senior leader is very, very important. It's ever more important with these young generations now. Uh, so I teach anywhere between you know, the 21-year-old to the 51-year-old, as it were, in executive education, but also the undergraduates. And the undergraduates are gener Generation Z, uh, I have daughters in that age bracket. I think others here in the room do too. Um, and what we're seeing there <coughs> is that um, they are not wanting to be squeezed into a corporate straitjacket. And, and I think we as senior leaders need to understand that and need to say, okay, how do I maintain a corporate identity with corporate policies and safeguards while also harnessing the creative talent that we heard about that wants to learn, that wants to fail, many of whom actually see their lives and their, uh, their careers as portfolios of experimentation, right? There is a little bit of corporate in there, there's a little bit of nonprofit work in there, there's friends and family. The new generations have a very different uh, ask of leaders and of employment. Uh, part of that is driven by the fact that they make a lot less money than we did at that same age by economic realities. Part of that is also that they've seen others work 80 hours a week in that straitjacket and don't want to lead the same life. So I think it's incumbent upon the leader to help induce that. Um, Melanie, I'll have you bring us down to yeah. some um, actual tech talent. Um, so you had a huge tech talent team at Microsoft. Tell us about some of the challenges that you've been facing recently and, and some of your strategies. Yeah, it's a great question. So first of all, thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, <clears throat> tech talent, I think, um, for us at Microsoft and other organizations does require, I think, a bit of a pause. It's a phrase, a set of words that gets thrown around a lot. And when I think about tech talent and the work we've recently done, it's about pausing and really trying to understand what are the specific, ca spe specific characteristics um, that you really need in your organization. It can vary by industry. It can vary by... Um, maturity of the business as well. And so in particular, I think a lot about AI tech talent. And I think most of us know that market is moving really quickly. And so the challenge today is to really define what does that mean for me and us at Microsoft, which could be different to a different industry, could be different to a, a startup, could be different to Google, for example, although that's one that's probably more similar. 
Um, <clears throat> and I think another sort of challenge is that we really have to think through is how different generations want to work. I actually thought that was super interesting and almost wanted to head down a generational conversation. Um, <clears throat> but when we think about post-pandemic life, the way we want to work and hybrid ways of working has really changed the way we need to think about tech talent. So defining who they are and the characteristics is one thing, and then meeting them where they're at is a very different way of working. Um, and so at Microsoft, we're very intentional about a hybrid way of working because we want to make sure we can meet them where they're at, understand what works for them personally, and also understand what we need as an organization to drive innovation. So that's, um, I think, probably the same challenge most companies have right now is to think about how to find them where they're at. Debbie, your background is in cybersecurity. Um, we, we were speaking this morning, actually, about the immense amount of data that is now coming into every company, regardless of its, its sector, and that that data needs to be protected. Um, do you see the challenges similarly in cybersecurity around talent? What differences might you see? Actually, you know, I, what everyone has talked about has been really important, you know, in terms of all the different perspectives that we have. When you think of cybersecurity, people often think of it as being deeply technical, and the, the culture part of it completely <coughs> sort of gets, gets lost. And so when we're looking at um, cybersecurity professionals, most of the time from an operational standpoint, they're, you know, it's like being a firefighter. You're always, you know, really challenged with a, a, a high volume of um, work with a lot of complexity. And so as far as talent is concerned in bringing sort of the next generation around into this, into this realm, one of the things that we have to sort of get back to is development, developing people, nurturing people, having safe spaces for folks because there's a ton of failure in cybersecurity. We're, the, the enemy's still beating us. And there's a sense of feeling that way each and every day. And so you are examining problems and issues. And I think that one of the things, I know, Frederick, when you talked about the idea of failure, it brought me to the idea of how companies and organizations have to be reflective and there has to be uh, realistic postmortems that are that are completed that help folks to be able to sort of um, evaluate what went well and what didn't, but also to grow from that. And I think that when I say that we're missing sort of the development piece, there's a strong need in our industry to have apprenticeships, if you will. It's very hard if you were to use the firefighter uh, paradigm to have a person come along that's new. When you're fighting the fire, it, there's oftentimes not a lot of, um, uh, of time to bring someone along and sort of uh, train them when you're in the heat of battle. And I think that that piece of it, though, is the most important, the apprenticeship part of it. I think that um, w it's a field where people come into it, and most of what they've learned practically and foundationally is um, good to have, but the threat evolves so rapidly and with such velocity that a lot of what they find that they've learned is not always useful and practical operationally. And so for that reason, we have to not only have the people who sort of offer the training or who are the, the folks that are leading the apprenticeships, they have to have a career path as well as the folks that are coming through. And it has to be really practical and not so vague or so, um, what's the word for it, so um, unattached to reality so that they can see that when they're working hard in school or when they're working hard to get a certification or when they're working hard in the field that it has some practical application to what they'll actually be doing when they go to work inside of a corporation. And I, I would just mention one other thing. There, this idea of having um, you know, reasonable postmortems really, or, or blameless, I like to call them blameless postmortems, is also at the very highest levels in the organization. You will note that there's a trend in cybersecurity now where you're starting to see a lot of the chief information security officers get trotted out in front of um, legal and the SEC and you know, having to deal with lots of um, um, 
Some would call it scapegoating, others would call it accountability for decisions made in the organization that those folks simply didn't make those decisions on their own. And so there's a chilling effect to that. And so a field that needs so many people, we need millions of people, we are so short staffed, if you will. Um, we have to find a way to make our, um, our space much more friendly, much more inviting, and um, much more comfortable for people to have the opportunity to fail and learn from it. Ms. Ab, you attract investment in the ICT sector in Bahrain, and that obviously requires a huge tech talent pool. What have been some of the initiatives or strategies that you've used in order to build up that pool in Bahrain? Well, thank you for that, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, so when we talk about talent, let me, let me just roll back a little bit. Uh, to really stay abreast of talent challenges and talent demand, you need to, I'd, I'd say the word that I would use is you need to have a vision. You need to see into the future, but have the flexibility to course correct, because we keep talking about talent, but actually what people tend to mean is skill, not talent. And, but, but everything I've been hearing today is really about the core of that. So Bahrain is a small country. We, we have, we're a population of one and a half million, but we punch way above our weight. And the reason we punch above our weight is because we have vision that's coming from the very top of leadership and the talent to back it up. So at the heart of everything that we do is education, 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 and as Debbie said, being practical. You know, we, we look to, to do things in a practical manner. So I'll touch upon some of what we've done, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So what we've done actually is, first of all, um, we've made sure we have strong education. We've been shifting in more recent times towards more vocational education to be, to be for people to be able to upskill and reskill very easily and very quickly. And we've made it very straightforward for our, our clients, our partners, our customers, our friends to use our talent to, to solve their problems. So it's not just about solving our problems. We want to work collaboratively with everyone for us, for us to be a, a part of their solution. So we actually provide talent uh, to the region, to our neighbors, such as Saudi Arabia and UAE, but actually we also provide talent to the US. So for example, we have a number of talent hubs that are now set up. Anywhere, the headcount is anywhere from 200 up to a, a forecasted 1,000, in uh, such as uh, Citibank for, for um, FinTech trading platforms, we've got for um, uh, blockchain, we've got for software development, we have for cybersecurity. And it's as a result of us thinking ahead and being ready to, um, being, being ready to, to adjust and be collaborative in that approach. Interesting. Um, Melanie, I want to build a little bit on what Misa was saying and, and talk about this issue of uh, this topic of collaboration um, mm -hmm. between companies, <coughs> academia, the government. Um, what experiences Microsoft have in this area? What are some of the lessons that you've learned from that? Yeah, there's a few different areas, a few different focus areas. Um, recently, we did announce a partnership with the University of Wisconsin as we are thinking about our data center, center footprint and working with them to build manufacturing focused AI talent in the region. And so I know a lot of companies work with academic institutions. Um, so it's not unique to Microsoft. But what is really important is that we ourselves are looking ahead, similar to what Musab said, looking ahead to understand what is the talent we need in the area. And then how do we partner, not just to develop the skills and capabilities for what we might see, but also more broadly. Um, I also think there's something really interesting, and I was thinking a little bit about it when Frederick was talking, as well as you, Olaf, um, in regards to some of those softer skills that perhaps we don't naturally think about when we're building domain expertise. And as the world is moving super fast, it's only going to get faster. How do we build um, or how do we develop undergraduate students or non-traditional talent to be able to navigate change quickly? And so that's a learning agility point. And how do we pull that into undergrad classes, I think is really interesting versus perhaps waiting for a postgraduate degree 
where we start to really <coughs> double click into some of those types of skills. And so I do wonder if we can shift just from domain into a more broad um, set of uh, ag agile based skills. <coughs> Um, one other thing that's on my mind is also just when I think about soft skills is coaching. So you, you mentioned, Frederick, that prompt engineering or prompt skills might not be required in a year from now. So how do we look ahead there? And I couldn't agree more. So right now we're so used to teaching machine speak mm. that we're in classes going, here's how you engage with technology. Here's the language you need to use. But if you think about the lay person, the non-technologist in the room, I think about well, how am I going to coax and coach and talk to um, technology to get out of it what I need? And again, I'm thinking about this new era of AI. And so when I think about universities, I think about academic institutions, I do wonder if we have an opportunity to just pull some of our traditionally softer skills into our education around coaching. You coach a person, you can also coach a machine. You know, you can be agile, but you can be agile at pace. You can have, you can learn, but you can have learning agility, which is adapting all the time. So that's that's where I'm thinking about um, the partnership. And of course, many of us are already partnering with different institutions. I'm sure all of you have a lot of corporations coming towards you as well. But um, I do think we can do things differently in our partnerships going forward. Could I, could I jump in here for a minute, mm -hmm. actually? Because you're talking about the future and about AI and the, mm. the, the changing landscape. I think it's a, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. So um, a couple of things. First of all, I think we historically we've been focused on teaching people how to do, to, uh, to your point about domain. But I, I'm very enthused to hear that actually we, we're on the same wavelength. We need to teach people how to think and, and more importantly, how to think creatively. Because, so there was a quote that I saw, which is um, somebody was saying, I want AI to do my cooking and cleaning so I can do art and writing. Mm -hmm. I don't want AI to do my art and writing so I can do the cooking and cleaning, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? So it's, one thing that I think has been somewhat de-emphasized in our, in our academic pursuits has, has been, uh, uh, you know, outside of like specifically art degrees, is that creative thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think those are more needed than ever. Now, I have, I have huge respect for academia. My, my father's a, a university professor. But I think we're trying to, to get academia to do something it wasn't designed to do in the tech space, which is much more vocational in nature. So I think, and, but, and I definitely love the angle that I've been hearing from, from Frederick, from Olaf, from Emily, and yourself, Debbie, about the human element. If we forget that the, the human element is to understand, empathize, and connect, we run the risk of actually getting more isolated as we just become more technified, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if that's such a word. Yeah. Yep. I, I, could, I couldn't agree more. You can already tell I'm like shivering in my seat <laughs> here. Because, you know, first of all, let me just, let me just validate. Uh, for, uh, universities around the world, and including the best ones, are still teaching to an 18th century model. Mm -hmm. It was developed, at least the American system is based on a, on a German system, mm -hmm. right, of the 17th, 18th century. We're teaching volume, right, the sage on the stage. There is, a, you know, there is the rows of students. And the more, the better, because we got to make it efficient. That is an outdated model for the future, right? We need to teach differently, mm -hmm. and we need to, to and we need to teach different content. The other thing I wanted to validate is, um, you know, y we've been mentioning coaching so mm -hmm. many times. Young people, tech talent in general, but especially the young talent, they want the coaching. They're asking for it. They're dying to have it. I get the highest teaching evaluations when I coach students, mm. when I open up in office hours or do a lot of small teamwork. They love that so much more than even a very inspiring lecture, right? Mm -hmm. And it is single-handedly HR professionals, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I've been speaking with them uh, a and they've been saying, look, the coaching leader, the mentor, is single-handedly the most valuable way to exercise leadership, but it's also the most undervalued. Mm -hmm. As cultures, we seem to value the visionary, the strong alpha, right, uh, versus the person enabling everybody else, right? Organizations all say 
they value that. But how many leaders are really like that, right? And do we really reward people for that? So I agree. I also think, uh, to your point of teaching different things, um, we have been making mistakes, and I will include business schools in this, and that we've always been saying, teach students tools. Mm -hmm. And yes, they need to have certain tools because especially as an MBA, I have to be deployable from day one. Mm -hmm. I can't say to my bosses, I wanna learn for a year and you gotta pay me for that. Unfortunately, we're not there yet, right? So mm -hmm. yes, you have to learn some tools, but to base a $200,000 education for two years on learning a bunch of tools that are gonna be outdated in three more years, mm -hmm. and I'm being very generous here, is not a sustainable value proposition, mm -hmm. right? And so we do need to te te uh, teach people how to think, how to reconceptualize, how to acquire new knowledge, how to pay attention to people. In our engineering school at Berkeley, which is one of the best around the world, especially on AI, we have, we have AI PhDs coming to us saying, look, we understand code, right? We're, we're at one of the best schools in the world for code. We don't understand people. And, it, and, you know, they need to be taught how to, you know, philosophy, anthropology, psychology, sociology, right? All of those things to design systems that do exactly as you were mm -hmm. saying, I think if I understood you, Mel, correctly, which is, hey, it should be, uh, you know, technology for humans, not humans for technology. Mm -hmm. And I think just now at this, at this threshold with AI, there's this great awakening that we, we're now getting AI into our heads. We need to do better with people rather than training people to do right by technology, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. That's so true. I, I want to uh, mention something also that you just made me think of, Ola. As you are teaching and leading your classes in, in instruction, w when you consider the multimodal sort of way that people receive data today, I've noted that with, you know, within cybersecurity, something that's been very effective for us has been gamification mm -hmm. and creating video games where people learn and work together, but also where there's a human in the loop and they have to collaborate after the fact or during, throughout the process in order to be able to, um, you know, solve a deep problem. Um, when you've got social media where, uh, you know, you have Facebook, has you know 350 billion photos um, downloaded daily or you know uploaded daily I guess you could say or you know Twitter 200 billion tweets a year or whatever those numbers are folks are spending a lot of time on these platforms and I'm just curious what your thought is a lot of people say well you got to take the message to the people or you've got to meet them where they're at and I know there's some sort of a balance there, but what are your thoughts on using these other modes to reach students or to widen the aperture of people that otherwise would feel sort of locked out of the buzzwords of tech or, you know, um, uh, areas that seem very complex like AI or quantum? I, I mean, I think it's a great thought provocation. I think it is a design challenge, right? And, um, and I, I'm a big fan of meeting people where they're at. Um, I think increasingly young people are also understanding the limitations of social media, but mm -hmm. it's here to stay. It's not just gonna die just because it's making some severe mistakes like <laughs> inducing depression in young women and things like that, right? We have all heard those studies. But there's still great power in social media, but we have to design it differently. And you know, I, I see it as an equally valid thought provocation when I hear about how TikTok in the United States is different from TikTok in China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, we're twerking in the United States, and they're learning how to be astronauts. And uh, and you know, I'm not yep. saying, yep. right? That's I true. mean, I'm right. not saying stop the twerking and everybody become an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> nor do I necessarily want to become, you know, uh, or switch regimes, or, right? Or our exes have become excrements. Th there we go. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> But, but I do think uh, being more purposeful about the design, right? Wh who was it, Mark Andreessen, who said, you know, we wanted flying cars and we got 160 characters, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, I'm actually, I like Twitter even today, uh, I'm on it, but, but yeah, are we designing social media to really play at its best and to empower tech talent, and especially young talent, to play at its best? But I think it can be done. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it has been done yet, yeah, you know? Uh, and I think, I think there's another problem with it, which is that, so we've, we've been using certain words, like I, I love your, the, what you said about gamification. Mm -hmm. What I think, so earlier I was talking about, we need to boost creativity, because that's us being human. Mm -hmm. 
creativity, you boost it through play. Okay, and, and I think one of the problems is that a lot of the tools are designed to be used in, whether by design or just by con social consensus, ends up being used in a certain way. Um, which means, and, and a, this ties in what we were talking about earlier about failure. Go express yourself, be, be silly, be absurd, be whatever, and then learn from it. Learn your boundaries, learn what can be done, play. I find that the most, my personal belief is that the most rounded individuals in any given setting are those that have experienced, okay? Mm -hmm. And it, it reminds me of a, an anecdotal story I was, I'd, I'd read once, which is, um, someone said, oh, I, I went and I tried music, but I wasn't very good at it. And the person, they, they told it, it's like, being good's not the point. Experiencing it is the point. You can be, uh, among a group of chefs, you can be the best engineer. Among a group of engineers, you can be the best chef. The fact that you can cross that barrier is, I think, what we need in our talent. Because, again, we run the risk of being isolated into silos if we don't have people that know how to operate in multiple domains. And in fact, it's been yeah. shown, right, that, that breakthrough innovation happens uh, with greatest likelihood when domains collide, right, at the mm -hmm. intersections. Yes. It feels that also um, for this next generation of folks that are coming into work, um, there is a, uh, a, I guess what the ACLU calls, this is the golden renaissance of surveillance. So people are, their jobs and their roles are metricized in ways that are very task driven and that's how they're measured. And so their KPIs or key performance indicators are not only very intrusive, in the work environment, but they're also completely missing a whole dimension of human life, human being. I, I know when we get people in from an HR perspective, when we have um, uh, folks that are have applied for positions in cybersecurity, we have this thing that we used to kind of joke about called the dictionary attack, where the person puts in all the key words, and that's what gets them into like maybe the first couple steps of qualification. And then to meet them in person, their skill set may or may not match whatever the description is. And we're finding that overall that sometimes that's a wasted cycle. It's so much easier to have that first meeting, like that first qualifying meeting be like directly with the person. Mm -hmm. And I feel that I talked to so many folks who say that they were you know, interviewed by a robot mm -hmm. or they had to take a test and that that was their introduction into a company's culture. And it's dismaying because you really want to know the whole human being, not just how they scored yep. on your assessment. Mom, you want to jump in on this? And um, Yeah, happy to. I was sitting here thinking, I was like, oh, what do we do at Microsoft? How do we, <laughs> how do we navigate that? Because you've got the challenge of scale, yeah. yes. right? <clears throat> and so you need to think through how do you invite the best talent in and there are ways to differentiate you know, yourself as a, as a company or an organization. And so we use culture. We are founded on growth mindset. Your colleague, Carol Dweck, has been instrumental in how Microsoft has created a culture of learning and innovation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and with that, we find that we have a lot of people who want to work at Microsoft. So it's a great prosperity problem that we have. And so you do need to use the tools available to you to help narrow that pipeline down. You just do at scale. There is very little way to navigate through that. But your point on understanding what makes that person themselves unique and different is where the power of an engagement comes. And we do um, a lot of skills but also culture-based interviews when we think about uh, talking to candidates and what's most important for Microsoft but also for them and really trying to shift to a values-based interview approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it's super interesting, right, because then you've, you've screened in the domain right. and then we're now shifting into the, the value of respect and growth mindset and integrity and accountability mm -hmm. to try and understand whether or not that person is going to thrive in our environment because we also really want them to be their best and thrive at Microsoft. Um, but it's a super interesting question because the first step in at scale tends to be um, some form of navigation where keywords do matter. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, does that just 
is that actually a skill in itself? They've been able to connect <laughs> the dots. Keywords, they've done right. the critical thinking. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, they can critically think. Why wouldn't we want to talk to them? It's funny. But yeah, yeah so. I, I, I'd be curious, Melanie, uh, <coughs> as it relates to the pandemic. What we found, we had this amazing phenomena that has been one that's been hard to sort of um, uh, adjust now that people are out and about again mm -hmm. and everybody's reporting to the uh, uh, role in their one person. We had the phenomena of people in cyberspace doing two or three things, like being a virtual CISO or a, a, you know, a, um, a assessment oriented person doing you know, just third party assessments or um, answering questions and doing advisory work and maybe doing like three different things because they were not in an office with a manager every day and the round the clock schedule and working at home afforded them the opportunity to not just do many things. In some ways, some folks learning curve went you know way up, but in other ways, they also were earning quite a bit as well. And it's always, the rules have always been a little bit loose yeah. around cybersecurity particularly, and I'm wondering if that phenomena um, is, it found, has been found in other places, if you've seen that sort of a thing, now that people are back to work and as you're demanding that they come into the office three days a week, it sort of messes everybody's side hustle up, you know? <laughs> I, I love the question, and it probably wouldn't surprise you to know that our employees ask the same questions. Really? As well in town halls, because they see other companies, they have friends, you know, they have um, different conversations. You know, I, I heard you speak earlier about this firefighting mode of cybersecurity, mm -hmm. and when I then just heard that question, I always think about what what are the sets of accountabilities we can give an individual so that they're not just in this mode of firefighting, therefore allowing them downtime to go do their advisory work, but also balancing proactive versus the reactive work. And mm -hmm. cybersecurity is super interesting in that we all play a role. Mm -hmm. So how does a CISO take that opportunity to not just lead those big moments that are sometimes very difficult moments, but also build the culture of security above all else? And so when you think about shifting someone's accountabilities, we call them core priorities, mm -hmm. um, into one that is broader than perhaps what might be considered their domain or their day job, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, you, you can hold them more accountable to the ecosystem of the company they work at. From culture, through the leadership, through the domain, yes, the firefighting yes. that happens. So we like to really use our um, performance and development system to help us do that, set the core priorities, make sure that some people understand their roles are broader than just their day job. In fact, part of our culture is that we um, make others better around us and we leverage other people's work to make our own work better and so it starts to create this teaming environment and set of accountabilities that in turn hopefully fills their day yeah. with amazing things not just for the day job but on behalf of the company culture leadership and so on um, but you know through the coming out of the pandemic I know a lot of companies have mandated a return to mm. office we have intentionally not done that, but instead moved to a hybrid work. Uh, and it's a little bit back to the talent conversation of meeting talent where they're <coughs> at. Right. We don't want to be a company that requires people to move to high cost living um, or um, places after they've moved their families. We want to be a, a company that understands the talent market. We use LinkedIn mm -hmm. so we can see the data. Everyone mm -hmm. can yeah. do that if they wish to, see where their talent is and then try and create the moments that matter and so we not just think about return to office but we think about hybrid and how do we intentionally create those moments that matter that are in person but not five days a week, Monday through Friday or you know, s Sunday through Thursday depending on where you are in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, go, go ahead Olaf, I'll, I'll go to you. Yeah, just, just, to, just to layer on to that, so we, we're actually seeing the same phenomenon. Uh, certainly for us, we're a small organization um, mm -hmm. and so we rely on expanding and contracting depending on client uh, projects and demand and volume. Um, and so we get a lot of young people, tech talent, that have a whole bunch of things going on. And some of that is driven by just who the generation is. Some of that is driven by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Some of that is driven by, frankly, also the corporate environment and the ecosystem of tech these days not exactly being loyal to people either. We hear about all these layoffs. I get students coming to me saying, I'm scared. I take a job with company XYZ, blue chip. 
year down the road, I could be laid off. And so uh, a risk mitigation strategy is to have multiple things. We call it uh, entrep uh, portfolio entrepreneurship in your mm -hmm. career. Right. That's better than side hustle. Uh, right. I like side that. hustle. Although I like I that. It sounds that. yes. <laughs> it sounds more gritty though. Yeah. So, you know. so yes, less technocratic. Exactly. But so the, the challenge then for us is in fact, uh, we came we came off a call this morning as a leadership team saying, How do we deal with our current associates and interns? Mm -hmm. And you have to spend extra effort and I think leaders need to get ready for this creating that allegiance, creating programs, you know, how do we make sure that they actually feel attached to us? more or less than to other people, right? How do we create moments of delight and moments of learning and a great experience? So when they think of us, mm -hmm. they don't think of a work task, they think mm -hmm. of a great experience. Or a purpose. Right. A purpose, yeah. Yeah. purpose, yeah. Is purpose is a, a really, really big, right? And, and for somebody like, like you in an ecosystem building function, yeah. um, I think that's really critical because you have to know that people will move and fluctuate it's like this big amoeba, right? And, so and yeah, Th thank ahead. you for setting up my <laughs> my oh. my, uh, my commentary. <laughs> this is this Sabo, working brilliantly. Sabo, before you speak, I'll just warn the audience. Um, I will be turning to you shortly for mm. questions, so you can start pondering now while Ms. Abbas is speaking. But please go ahead. Okay, so um, <laughs> we're talking about post-COVID. Okay, so post-COVID, so pre-COVID. You know, when I talk about Bahrain being an enabler near shore, it really kind of means you know I'm competing against people within you know two three hours. Post-COVID, I'm now competing against Estonia, Philippines, India, Egypt, US, uh, everyone. It's completely changed the paradigm. But what it's also changed is it's changed the criteria on which the, the let's say, the competition for talent, and it could be a friendly competition, uh, because now a lot of people want to go for a better quality of life. Mm. But they don't just want a better quality of life, they want to be able to save some bucks at the end of the month. So they want lower lower cost. And that's that's how we've been able to compete. We have this beautiful, ba and by the way, we uh, blanket invitation to everyone. We'd love to host you in Bahrain. So you can see that this is not all hot air, you know, and we're actually standing, <laughs> standing by what we're saying. Um, but we have, we have an island of calm, an island of stability that provides a very high quality of life, uh, ranked among the top in the world, and with a, with a much lower cost. But then we also layer onto it a couple other things that a lot of people don't know about Bahrain. Uh, the first is retention, and I think that's mm. key. We're, we're all talking about acquisition, right. but the other, the other side to the coin is retention. Okay, I acquire them, but if they're out the door the next day, I have not done anything. Mm. Um, we have an extremely high rate of, attention, uh, of, of retention, and that's partly, um, it's partly cultural, it's partly the, the stability and the, the quality of life that everyone has. Uh, and another thing that, that we also have is um, very high gender diversity. So we've, we've created an environment where about 41% of our tech workforce today are women, and about 51% of our STEM students are women. And we've tried very, very hard to create this environment that's just enabling. Um, and COVID is actually just focused on those qualities more than anything. Mm. I will open this up to our audience. Does anyone have any questions? I think we have one here, and the mic is coming to you, so just give us one minute. There we go. All right, over here. I would like to get the panel's thoughts on the recent um, announcement by FTC on the non-compete ban. So how does that impact the battle for tech talent? How does that impact the retention strategy? How does that Im impact the amount of investments you do in training people? Because knowing that they can be out the next week, right? So I'm just curious to get uh, the panel's thoughts on that. Yeah, I'd love to jump in. That's okay, great question. Um, <clears throat> like we truly believe that a dynamic tech market or talent market is critical for innovation. So we don't wanna lock employees in in perpetuity into a company. And we were talking about this earlier. If you, if you think about the Valley, for example, people get experiences they then take those capabilities, go to another company, build those capabilities up, innovate in different ways. They go to another uh, company with more capabilities, build even additional skills and innovate again. And you see the system all rising up because of talent movement. And this talent movement then results in development, a development of not just capabilities, but innovation for our customers. So there, it, it's okay for talent movement, for sure. Um, and as an HR person, I am like, oh, that costs us a lot of money. What are we going to do now? How do we solve for that, right? And 
then it, it does take me back to what is going to differentiate us compared to some of those other um, companies. And I find culture is one of those um, items that is just deeply embedded in us as a company and also what some of the younger generation are looking for. Um, they want to find purpose in their work. They want to see themselves in the mission and the vision. They want to go home and talk to their families and friends about how proud they are to work for different companies. And so we think about those intrinsic levers that we can pull to help employees feel like they truly belong and that it can make a difference in the world. Um, and so, you know, creating that I think is really important. And we still see talent move. And then we think to ourselves, they're off learning something they couldn't learn with us. And at some point we'll see them come back and we'll all be different as a result of it. And so I do believe that all boats rise as we see dynamic talent markets happen. And um, it does mean that sometimes in our organisations we have to adapt and we certainly do want to understand who our critical talent is and make sure that we work with them very, very closely as well, of course. It's a great question. Another question? I, I, might, I might actually just layer onto that really briefly, uh, saying uh, you don't want to lock people up. It comes back around, right? You create bad brand equity, bad emotional <coughs> association. You want to create a pool of alumni out there who speak highly of you and who either come back or, you know, because people do come back sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember having been <coughs> at, at Qualcomm, for instance, and that company was famous for bringing people back after they had done a, a gig somewhere else. And that's very healthy. You bring fresh blood in. And they might refer other people to you that are actually maybe even a better fit than they are. So I think what's key is, of course, the IP element of this. But for that, you have NDAs and IP agreements. But to lock them up career-wise is just, I think it's an arcane method that should go away. Yeah. I am a boomerang. So I left Me Microsoft too. and came back. <laughs> no, so I'm, I'm a big <laughs> fan of being able to move and learn. Yeah. I did the same. Yeah. IBM. I worked for IBM in the yeah. 90s yeah. and then came back in, yeah. in the 20s. Mm. Uh, you have a question over there? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. I think there may be other reasons. Just curious to get your um, perspective on where you think upskilling senior citizens are these days, because I think they are really hungry to learn. They're, they're terrified of AI, especially when they hear, like, who's programming the algorithm, right? But you don't have to answer that question. Just really, what do you think about upskill senior citizens? Second, where do you think we are on the journey of, of Wall Street or the exchanges accepting this mindset because they're still wanting to see the bottom line and the growth. And and th I think this needs to, it, this slows down a little bit. You're seeing corporate America all of a sudden pulling back on ESG, diversity, et cetera. That trend's been happening the, in the last year. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Just curious to get your thoughts. You want to start? Oh, um, that? I could actually jump in. So. Um, Let's start with the first one, with upskilling senior citizens. And keep in mind, I am talking from a more Bahraini perspective, so it may, may differ from what's on the ground here. Um, we've had a very successful case study recently. Uh, we launched a vocational training academy. It's private sector, uh, but they launched a vocational training academy called uh, Re Reboot. And what they do is it's a two-year program, six, uh, four modules, and you can specialize in one of those modules. And the youngest person, the, the, the first cohort is about 257 people. The youngest person is 16 years old, and she's attending with her mother. And the oldest person is a 57-year-old tr uh, truck driver, and everything in, 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 in between. It can be done. I think it's about just showing them, making it easy, showing them how you can get from point A to point B, and ideally, creating some opportunities at the end of it. So, but it, vocational is the way that we're, we're approaching that particular problem. Now, with regards to uh, Wall Street, I can't comment on Wall Street specifically, but I can comment more broadly about, um, let's say, the financial industry, uh, given that Bahrain is a, a financial hub. ESG is, is, is key. You know, we're, we're actually finding a more effort being put into ESG, and we're finding that as more, more, more and more people enter the workforce, they care that the, that the work they do in the environment that they work in has an ESG element that they're that they're contributing. So actually, we're finding that the consciousness of of working in a in, in the appropriate framework is going up, not uh, not down. Um, how they do it though will vary from from entity to entity. So that that's that's been our experience on the matter. 
I would jump in and on the um, AI piece just a little bit and this idea of Wall Street. So you have last year, and I would say, and I've often described um, ChatGPT's introduction onto the scene as kind of a black swan event. We were already working in the AI. We already knew quite a bit about what we were doing there, but it totally democratized things by putting it right in the hands of the end users. And a lot of corporations, I was working as a consultant actually for IBM at the time, and a lot of organizations really were in a scramble because of FOMO, like fear of missing out, number one, and feeling like this is a big pivot point, which it is, and feeling like they needed to act. And a lot of what I saw at the end of um, 2023 was many people putting in their annual reports productivity gains on um, AI that wasn't even deployed yet. But this anticipation has set the bar so high that coming into 20. 24, people are still trying to sort through governance. They're still trying to sort through, um, you know, accuracy, security, privacy, and and be ready for some level of um, uh, regulatory coming their way. And so I think that um, you know there's so much there's so much promise and so much peril. But I do think when you look at AI in general, how it will make things a lot simpler for your senior citizens, for instance, to be able to learn. If people have the natural curiosity, or if they are, um, what did you say, openly curious? What was the? I'm like curious. That? The curious was? Compulsive. compulsive. <laughs> yes, compulsive curiosity. It's, gonna, it's a tide that continues to lift all boats. It's the degree to which you are in the game. Um, and just one last thing, in cybersecurity they did, um, with the CSA, the Cloud Security Alliance, did this major study of 2,500 cybersecurity folks, and they were basically trying to figure out whether or not, how they felt their jobs would be impacted by um, AI. And it was literally a third, a third, a third. There was a third of the people that felt like, oh my gosh, this is gonna, they're gonna automate everything, they won't need me anymore. A third of the people thinking, oh, it's gonna be weaponized against me, my job's gonna become so much harder because the bad guys are using AI and we've got to figure out how we're doing it. And then a third of the folks that were like, you know what, this is going to help my job because it makes having, being able to, to uh, employ AI makes it easy for me to bring a junior analyst up to a much more senior role because a lot of what they would have to do in a way of critical thinking is sort of handed to them. <laughs> and so it does a lot of um, summarization and it cuts down on a lot of the um, creative writing that folks have to do to s explain incidents and things of that nature. A lot less paperwork so that they can have the critical thinking sure. for solving some of the, the um, forensic challenges, CFIR type problems. Um, yeah. I'm a big fan of bringing seniors into the picture and I don't know how you define that but, but, but assuming it's sort of baby boomers and up. Uh, uh, because they bring judgment. Yep. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget, right, we need young tech talent for their curiosity and their energy and their youthfulness and their willingness to explore. But a lot of older folks bring the same attributes and on top of that they bring business judgment, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes in Silicon Valley I feel like we're in this youth craze mm -hmm. where I've got students, MBA students, 33 years old coming to me saying, I feel old when I'm on a panel in Silicon Valley. <laughs> well, if they're old then I'm a fossil. <laughs> right, but I would, you know, I've seen a lot of instances where a very young, high revving team, super smart people, would have benefited from a little bit more wisdom and 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 judgment. And so I'm I'm a big thumbs up on that. We are just about at time, um, so I want to thank our panel so much. Thank you. I will conclude our session today with just a few remarks. Um, to summarize a bit of what we've heard. Um, but I want to thank all of you for your participation and again to our speakers for being with us. Um, we've explored, I think, a, a number of themes today and um, a number that I, I hope you found as, as interesting as I have, um, thinking about the skills that are, are necessary and the attributes that are necessary thinking about how we can encourage collaboration and the role that collaboration plays across sectors, but also, as, as we were discussing, even between companies, um, as we think about developing talent, 
um, and how we can continue to maintain this through a need to, to control costs. Um, some of the points I remembered and, and jotted down as we were going through um, this, ish, uh, this concept of having a, a mind state for the future. I'm thinking about that. Um, meeting people where they're at and how you can keep that in mind as we're recruiting. Um, I love the <laughs> side hustles or um, portfolio entrepreneurship, however we want to refer to it. Um, and, um, and then given that that is how we're operating, how we can make people feel attached to our organizations and, and how we build those bonds and giving them a sense of purpose. So um, I want to thank everyone again. Um, before we go to our reception, we are going to have some speed networking in the back of the room here. There will be four tables, and I believe that each table has a theme on it. Um, and so when we stand up, if all of you would move back there just very briefly, we'll do five minutes. Um, and after five minutes, we'll call it out and you can switch tables. Please spend a little bit of time with somebody who you haven't spoken with and, and talk about a theme that um, from your own perspective or from what you've learned today. And then we have a reception afterwards, which I think is out outside. Um, so thank you all again for your participation.